bottle caps. We've been very lucky lately, Captain. It's The weather has been beautiful. Mm-hmm. I call this IPA weather. Sit on the back porch and have a nice beer. Get your white witch on. And we can do so because some of our best friends filled up the fridge for us this week. Mm-hmm. First up, we have Karina and Newport, Rhode Island. Karina says, thanks for covering the case that I requested. This round is on me. Nice jib. Next up in beautiful parts unknown, we have Kelly, Nassim, and Samantha. Parts unknown. You know, the kids are calling it PU for short. (laughs) Real quick note. uh, Yeah, we had a guy peeing on the tennis courts yesterday. Uh, We can't confirm or deny if that was Nick or not. (laughs) But we've we've unleashed a full investigation. Full investigation. And we will take the appropriate measures uh, to make sure this does not happen again. And a big cheers to Melody up in... Nova Scotia. Let's go out to Wisconsin. We have a very nice person in Wisconsin. Got Al- cheese head. Alyssa, who says this is on behalf of her dear friend, Leanne. Leanne is celebrating a birthday this month. She loves the captain. So happy Yo, birthday, Leanne. Yo, Leanne, Leanne from the garage. You cheese head, you crazy cheese head. Next stop, let's say thank you to Jamie in Arizona. And last but not least, we have a round from the Trails End Tap House in Snohomish, Washington. Mm-hmm, I'm sure you said that right. Possibly. So uh, thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge this week. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And make sure you follow us on all social media at True Crime Garage. Speaking of which, we're getting a lot of questions about the old episodes because mm-hmm. I, we did our top 10 recently. Uh, the old episodes, we did a season one, we did a season two. So th- those would be episodes one through 40. They're available in the iTunes store. You got to look for episodes and albums, mm-hmm. uh, things of that nature. So check out the old episodes. They're on our store page at truecrimegarage.com as well. All right. That's enough of the business. Let's get to the troll. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Utility emergency dispatch. We found a human skull. Oh my gosh! I know. Uh, we got a. Uh, is it a meter leader? Yes. I'm going to just speak right now with the representative from our field services facilities. Hi. I'm going to. Uh, everything is recorded. Here he is. How are you doing? Uh, skull of a. If you believe it's human. What's the location? Please? It's right off of Suburban and Chickasaw in the Kelly Anthony area, right by the. Oh. School. Um, do you have a specific address for me or not? No, it's right by the school. If you take is it easy. You are. Yeah, he's in. Suburban and, and Goldenwood? Well, Suburban and Chickasaw. Chickasaw, I'm sorry. Yeah, and the school is right there. I can't think of the name of the school. It just go right straight down and dead ends right into the woods. Okay. It's, it'll be on the east side of uh, Chickasaw, Suburban. Um, east side of Chickasaw. And what is your um, party's name that we're going to meet with? Uh, He's not touching this, I hope. Okay. No, I can He's a... Um, he's a meter reader. Meter reader? Yeah, and I'll just tell him to stay at that location and just stay away from everything. Okay. Um, and if you can, try to stress to him to please not draw attention to the area. You heard at the end of yesterday's show an interview that took place just two days before this 911 call. Now, this 911 call is from a man named Roy Cronk. This took place on December 11, 2008. Roy went into the woods off of Suburban Drive, and he found something, and he poked at it. And then he calls his supervisor, who in turn calls 911, because Mm -hmm. Roy had found a skull. Police rope off the scene. The medical examiner, her name is Jan Garavala. Uh, Fami Malik. <laughs> no, thank God, not mm. in this case. Uh, for those of you who watch true crime shows, she is better known as Dr. G, medical examiner. Um, I don't know if her show is current. I've seen it a few times, but she did have a show uh, called Dr. G, medical examiner. But this falls in her jurisdiction. Dr. G describes the crime scene as such, that a body was placed in a wooded area about 20 feet off of the road. Now, there are a lot of plants and weeds and trees in this area. 
But in this spot, they find two tangled up and torn up black trash bags Mm -hmm. that are grouped with this large gray canvas bag. She says there are some bones that were in the bag. There are also some bones that were scattered amongst the vegetation. And then next to that, there is the skull that Roy had seen. It's obvious to police when they show up and they start canvassing the area that they're probably looking at the remains of a child. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is also in the vicinity of the Anthony household. Yes. It's approximately a quarter mile from the Anthony household. Now, this case could not get any stranger, but here, here's one very strange thing about this case. Roy Cronk had actually reported seeing something suspicious at this very same location on several other occasions. Now, it's been reported that he has called this in twice before, and it's also been reported that he's called it in three times before. Mm. I was unable to to verify which is the Wait, more so accurate right. statement. But when you say that he's called this in three times... We're talking about this particular skull. He's he's stating that he has called in that there was something suspicious in the woods. And I'll kind of take you through that. Mm-hmm. On the first occasion, Kronk says that he was there with co-workers. Now, Kronk is a meter reader. Mm-hmm. And he and two other meter readers had finished their checks early on that day. Big now, shout out to all the meter readers out there. Had, had, had some buddies that did that job for a long time. Well, and I don't know how this works, but they basically say that they finished the day a lot earlier than expected. Mm -hmm. And rather than going back to whatever facility that they work out of, they decided to take a a bit of a break and just kind of hang out in this section. Now, if you look at where this body was found on on a Google map, Mm -hmm. um, it's you, you basically have a big neighborhood and then you have this road. This is suburban road that that comes from behind the kind of behind the neighborhood there. And it kind of goes off into this dead end area. So it would be an easy spot for people to kind of just hang out and, 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 you know, yeah, you'll shoot the, the breeze after work. Well, you see this a lot with like housing developments. The, there's a road that's a dead end. That's really going to probably lead to more development down the line. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of what, what I'm assuming I'm looking at. Yeah. Yeah, and so the three of them decide to hang out there. They say they're there for about an hour or so, just, you know, chit-chatting and Mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes and such. Uh, While hanging out, Roy Kronk goes off to relieve himself, uh, peeing in the woods, basically. Uh, He says that he tells his co-workers that he thinks he saw either a bone or a skull in in this wooded area. Mm -hmm. So he... He goes over and he tells his friends about this. Well, the three of them walk back to this location so that Kronk can point out the skull or the bones that he thought that he saw before, you know, and what ends up happening is they spot a rather large dead snake. I think it was like four or five foot long snake that they saw there. And well, this distracts the three men. Don't, Don't live in Florida. This distracts the three men because then they're kind of checking out this, this snake. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if Roy got confused, if he thought, you know, well, maybe part of the bone that I saw or whatever white object I saw was just part of the snake. But what ends up happening is we know that we can verify some of Roy's story here because of two situations. First off, the men with their cell phones start taking pictures of the snake and they show these to other coworkers, mm-hmm. you know, that later that day or the next day. So they leave the spot that day, right? Well, Roy Cronk late that night, he decides to call the sheriff's department mm-hmm. and report what he has seen in the woods. So they dispatch an officer out to the area, but we got to keep in mind it's it's very dark out now and this is a wooded area. The officer looks around and does not see bones or a skull or anything, no remains at all. Uh, and keep in mind, we also have a situation where Roy Cronk is not there to point this object out to the officer. He calls it in, the officer goes out, checks the area, nothing is found. So that's his first call or first attempt. Or what was his second attempt? Well, one thing I want to point out here, Captain, is we heard on that 911 call when they're calling in this body, and it, you heard that a bit of confusion between the caller and the 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 dispatcher of, you know, kind of pinpointing this location. So mm-hmm. my guess is that just like we said, with, with it being dark out and without Roy being there, there was, she probably, the officer and her defense was probably just looking in the wrong location. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that, that 
somebody wasn't doing their job. They just didn't know the right location to look. Now, what ends up happening, though, after Roy follows up, you know, he wants to know, what well, did you find anything? Right. And he is told that, you know what you should do? We're going to, you should call this in again, uh, but make sure you call it in when it's still light outside so we can get an officer over there to look around and find the exact location mm-hmm. and take a look at what you think you have seen. Or possibly meet the officer out there. Yeah. So I believe it's the next day that Roy Cronk, he then calls it in again. And this is right after his work shift. Um, and at this point, an officer meets Cronk at the location. But what happens here, Captain, is this is this is accor- according to Roy Cronk. Mm-hmm. He states that the officer seemed agitated, that the officer didn't seem very thrilled about the whole call itself. He said it was mm-hmm. raining that day, and he didn't know if it was because of the story about the snake. He told the officer, yep, we saw this giant snake that was dead there. Can't blame him for that. He says that he... He didn't get the vibe that the officer wanted to go into the woods. Again, it could have been the rain, could have been the the snake, whatever. Mm -hmm. But but what ends up happening... Or just having a bad day, right? Well, what ends up happening, according to Roy Cronk, is that the officer does go into the woods. He's in there for a brief amount of time. He comes out. He's fairly rude to Roy Mm -hmm. and tells him that he's mistaken. He's seen nothing. There's nothing there. And then the officer goes about his business. Now, later we would learn... That there was a different story from the officer. The The officer says that the two of them went into the woods together mm-hmm. and all he found was a, what he described as a bag containing, um, like d- debris, like, like mm-hmm. lawn clippings and leaves and things of that nature. Um, the situation here though is nothing is found. All of this takes place in August of 2008 oh, in wow. August mm-hmm. with the bodies found in December of wow. 2008. So it's not until December 11th that a third or fourth call is placed to law enforcement. And that's when they go out and find the remains. So that, that very same day. Well, this is, you know, like we said, this is huge news all over the country. And especially in this area, this is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So you got this meter reader that's out in that neighborhood, probably often tells you, Hey, look, I saw a skull. I don't know if it was human or not. Come check it out. Mm -hmm. And then nobody kind of really follows up and people are still talking about this missing girl. It probably weighed on him. And so then he was like, well, I got to go back out and look again for myself. Yeah. I'm going to find it. And and I applaud him, you know, because if if he didn't do that, if he wanted to put the extra effort in, uh, maybe never found. Well, you know what I'm wondering too, is maybe he thought, all right, two officers have been to the location. They tell me that I'm mistaken. Does he just take their word? You know what I mean? And that maybe is why so much time elapsed between the actual mm-hmm. discovery. Does he just say, well, I called it in twice and and nobody right. nobody saw what I saw. And then you know how these meter readers work. They're not in the same neighborhood every day of the week. Right. He was probably out there a few months later and thought to himself, you know what? I'm still convinced I saw something over there. Oh, yeah. You saw what you saw. He goes into the woods. He says to relieve himself. I I actually think he went into the woods looking for what he thinks that he saw. Now, he would come under some speculation because what comes out very quickly in this situation is, you know, there's a lot of pushback from the community on to law enforcement. They're saying, well, this was called in three times at least. Yeah, There was definitely a ball drop. And there was there was this body that was found there. How do you miss that? And I don't know if this was leaked from the law enforcement angle or if this was just something in the media, but there was some speculation that maybe Roy Cronk had this information. And because there was this growing reward Mm -hmm. that maybe he sat on this information as the reward grew. I personally don't think that that's the situation. I think he saw something in the woods. He was convinced of it. He was talked out of it by law enforcement because I don't think they did anything wrong. I think they just, they didn't see what he saw and he happened to be back in the neighborhood and he decided, I'll tell them that I went in there to relieve myself, but I'm actually back there looking for what I, what I'm pretty convinced that I saw. Mm -hmm. And did you see, I mean, you saw video of him at at the trial, right? Correct. I mean, I, to me, he comes across as a very stand up guy. I, I don't know much about him, but his story is very believable to me. Now, what what we end up finding here is the the situation is this. 
that it's a, it's a crime scene. Yes. And Dr. G states that, uh, she believes that animals had moved some of the bones. Mm-hmm. Um, they discover that there is no tissue at all on this, on this body, on the remains. It's completely, mm-hmm. uh, decomposed. Uh, the thing with that is this is going to make it very hard to determine the cause of death Mm -hmm. because the body sat there for six months. So the other situation is the jawbone is still connected to the skull, which normally would not happen. Usually once all that soft tissue has, has decayed from the body, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the jawbone would drop off. The situation here though, is they discover duct tape that is still holding basically the jawbone to the skull. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, again, like we said, because of the level of decomposition that has taken place, it's very hard to determine the cause of death. Right. So we have a skeletor remain. Skeleton. Skeleton remain. Skeletor. What is this? He's a bad villain. No. So we have a skeleton remain. We have this bag, this uh, canvas type bag. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have black trash bags found at the scene. Mm Mm-hmm. And we have duct tape, which is over the skeleton's mouth, mm-hmm. holding the jaw in place. That's yeah. what we have. Correct. And so they are unable to determine the cause of death because of the level of decomposition. However, they do rule the death a homicide. Well, some right, people... Right, because let's be clear. The, the, the size of the skeleton is, is the size of a, a child. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, however it, however the child died by having the skeleton just sitting out in the middle of nowhere, that's, that's all the proof you need to know that there's, this is homicide. Well, thank you for saying that because some people have had a big problem with this stating that if, if you can't determine the cause of death, how can you rule it a homicide? And it's it's exactly, as you said, we have, we have a body that was concealed that somebody put it there so mm-hmm. that people may not find it or that a certain amount of time would elapse before it was found. The other thing that we know is that we have the trash bags, we have the canvas bag and the duct tape, all things that you probably shouldn't be finding with a body that, that would have an accidental death. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, this is furthermore, you know, it takes eight days, but after DNA testing, on the 19th, they reveal that this is, in fact, the body of the little missing girl, Kaylee Anthony. Mm-hmm, which so, is very sad. So on top of that, you have more cause to believe that it's a homicide because you have a girl that went missing, was not reported as such for an extended period of 31 time. 31 days. And then she's been missing for six months before they find her body. It's mm-hmm. pretty obvious to me. This has got homicide written all over. Yeah, this is kind of no duh. So now we've found the body of the missing little girl, right? And it's been identified as Kaylee Anthony. Mm -hmm. And we have this situation. We already know that Casey, the mother, is currently in jail at this time. Right. And suspected of the murder of her daughter because the daughter had not been found. Mm -hmm. Now the situation is this. The body is found a quarter of a mile from their home. It's You could pull out of their driveway and you would go down the street, make a right-hand turn, and basically you could pull something out of your trunk and walk it 20 feet into the woods. And that's, that's the body. That's mm-hmm. how it would take you three f- to five minutes to, to do that act. And then to return home, you could do this under the cover of night and probably nobody would see you again. If you look at the way that this is situated on, on a map here, right. there's not any reason for there to be traffic going through this location. There's not houses back there that I could see. Um, right. so, or if you wanted to, you know, walk it down yourself, it'd take you probably five to 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. The thing here is, so now we got this mother who looks, she's already looked guilty. Before. Even with your little troll legs, she could do it in five to 10 minutes. She's already looked guilty before the body's found. Now she's looking especially guilty. Mm-hmm. And we have a situation where we have her parents visiting her in jail and, and talking with her. And, you know, I, what is there's one famous clip out there where there there's some interaction between her and her mother and it doesn't Cindy say something she kind of starts off the conversation by saying uh we miss you uh we 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 forgive you we believe you yeah she says i uh i forgive uh we forgive everything you said and we forgive anything that you you did you did and this must be shortly after this body is found or at least identified as Kaylee Anthony mhm 
Yeah, that's roughly around that time. But a very strange interaction between the two of them. And it, it's almost like, you know, I really get the feeling that Cindy was hanging on to hope that that this really wasn't happening. That this yeah. whole this whole reality show that's taking place on the news that's about her daughter and her granddaughter, that it might not really be happening. Or that maybe, maybe Kaylee is out there somewhere and right. she's safe. She's holding on to hope. Or is she holding on to the hope that her daughter's not guilty of such a horrible crime? Well, no, I think if you look, if you look back two days before the body's found, she's sitting there saying, hey, look, you know, Nancy Grace is condemning my, you know, has already convicted my daughter. This top is, mom. Top mom. Well, top mom. Um, anyways, it, she's convicted her already. And the truth is going to come out when Kaylee comes home. And guess what? Your granddaughter's dead. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, but you're you, the spawn of you. Your daughter is most likely guilty of that. Right. And that has to hit you pretty quick as parents. Mm-hmm. And, you know, especially for these are not normal grandparents, right? Oh, they're not. No, no, <laughs> they're not. They're not normal in the sense of. Well, I mean, some of the stuff they say is just crazy, but they're not normal in the sense that the, the these were more Kaylee's parents than they were grandparents. Yes, you know, I, the, I see what you're saying. There, yes. this child lived with them, right? Mm-hmm. This child lived with them every day. You know, the mother of this child, uh, troll Casey, troll. You know, she li- who knows who the father is, right? I think she lied about all that shit. And and who was the father? Who who was the acting father? George Anthony, right? Mm-hmm. Those were her parents for all. You know, the the term mother and father that is just you know that is just some bullshit. You know, you're 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 not a mother or father unless. The action you have the actions to back it up. So just because you had a kid, for this is for all the deadbeat dads out there, deadbeat mothers out there. Just because you have a kid doesn't mean you're a mother. No, right? It's the actions. It's the raising of that kid. Yeah, it, you know. So now they have to deal with the fact that this girl is gone. Your daughter, technically your granddaughter, is gone, and she's not coming back. And you have to deal with that guilt and all the all the questioning and all that stuff. But now you're faced with reality that your your daughter's been lying to you this whole fucking time. Well, and according to the defense, according to Casey Anthony's defense, that the 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 parents had two very different reactions to the finding of the body. Because keep in mind, there were mm-hmm. eight days that passed before they through DNA evidence, you know, announced that it was in fact Kaylee Anthony. Right. And during this time, the defense states that George was handling it very, almost very policeman like, you know what I mean? He's, he's a facts guy. You know, the, you know, with most officers, there's not a lot of gray with them. It's a lot of black and white. Right. And the situation here is he's, he knows, man, he's, he's going, this body was found so close to my home. I know the last time I saw this little girl, right. this and, and he's basically going into the mode of, well, we need to step up this investigation now and find out what happened. Right. We need, this answers. is, be- this is before Kaylee's identified. Right. The mother, Cindy at the same time is saying, well, there's a lot of kids that, that live in this area. And on, on top of that, I think that I overheard that some, another kid has gone missing somewhere yeah, in the yeah, area. Yeah. It's probably not Kaylee. They had two completely opposite reactions to this situation. Now in their defense, in, in Cindy's defense, I don't want to harp on her too badly because mm-hmm. she's gone through something nobody ever should have to go through. But I, in her defense, I, I don't know how I would react to any of this information myself. I, right. I you know, we all want to hold out hope at some point. Um, it's strange to me that you can have people, two people living under the same roof with completely different reactions, though. Well, and those people being, you know, married individuals, mm-hmm. I mean, or a married couple, I shouldn't say married individuals, married couple. 
let's get let's get back into this uh, right after this quick beer break. Captain, we all need to take a little bit better care of ourselves. We go to the gym, we go jogging, but it's time to take care of mental health because mental health should be no exception. And that's why our sponsor, I love, I love this sponsor, Talkspace.com. They're the online therapy company that makes it easy to connect with experienced, licensed therapists handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist a text, audio, video message, whenever you want, and you can even do a live video chat. If you want to vent about work, if you want to vent about your co-host, you can do that. No problem. Your therapist is there to help. I love the convenience of Talkspace.com. They're available there for you 24-7. It's so easy. It's so convenient, and it's confidential as well. To sign up or to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash garage. As a special offer for our listeners, you can use coupon code garage to get $30 off your first month. That's code garage at Talkspace.com slash garage. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. Guess what I'm excited about? Bosch is back. Mm -hmm. Amazon's acclaimed crime series, Bosch, is back for a third season. I was watching a little Bosch last night. It's about Titus Welliver. He stars, he's the star. He stars Mm -hmm. as Detective Harry Bosch, who's an honest cop driven by a dark past. But he's cool because he's obsessed with punishing criminals, which we're all for that. He's haunted by the discovery of his mother's murder that was covered up by the police. Bosch also finds himself implicated in in the death of a serial killer that he is investigating. Yeah, you gotta love Titus. I mean, what a great actor. And he plays Bosch, and so Bosch is uh, navigating dangerous waters from a police department that believes he's guilty by working with a partner that doesn't know if he can trust Bosch. It's kind of this mixed up, crazy, entangled world. Mm -hmm. So Bosch will fight to prove that he's innocent, even pursues dangerous ex-special forces assassins willing to kill him or kill anyone that gets in their way. Against the glamour and seediness of Los Angeles, Bosch is going to risk everything to clear his own name. He's going to have to bring down the murderous crime ring no matter how many rules he has to break to do it. And this is all based on the best-selling novels by Michael Conley. So stream Bosch now. Stream season three now at Amazon Prime today. Check out season three of Bosch. Got a great book recommendation for you. It's called Incendiary by Michael Connell. For 16 years, long before the specter of terrorism haunted the public imagination, the Mad Bomber terrorized the citizens of New York City in the 1950s. From Grand Central to Penn Station to Radio City Music Hall, for most two decades, no place was safe from the man who signed his anonymous letters FP. He left his lethal devices tucked into phone booths, storage lockers, and plush seats of movie theaters. The race to catch him would give birth to a new science called criminal profiling, which changed the face of detective work and marked a turning point in how we fight crime today. Enter the mind of a madman in the real-life story of how three men came together to catch a monster in Michael Connell's latest book, Incendiary. The Psychiatrist, the Mad Bomber, and the Invention of Criminal Profiling. I like the sound of that. Critics all call Incendiary powerful historical nonfiction at its very best and impressively researched and deeply engrossing. Read Incendiary, the psychiatrist, the mad bomber, and the invention of criminal profiling by Michael Connell. Available wherever books are sold. All right, and we're back. Cheers, everybody. All right, Captain, what we need to do here is we need to fill in some blanks because yesterday when we were talking, we went through the situation of uh, the last time that Kaylee was seen. And then we have 31 days pass before she's reported missing, before Casey is arrested. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of blank space in there during that 30 days. And we have some information as to what was going on during that 30 days because, well, some of us have seen pictures of this on on TV and on the news. But furthermore, we have statements given from the Anthony family, this uh, being George and Cindy, but also including things that her brother Lee has said. Uh, We also have statements by Casey Anthony's friends and her boyfriend. Right. And now we're, we're investigating this as a homicide now, mm -hmm. now that the body is found. So we have to dive into these actions a little bit uh, more. Yes. And so 
the last time that it is agreed upon that, that Kaylee Anthony was seen alive was June 16, 2008. Mm-hmm. This is at the Anthony family home. Now, on that day, Cindy Anthony testified that she left for work a few minutes before 7 a.m. Now, while this was while everybody was still asleep at the house. At 7.52 a.m., we start to see some activity from Casey Anthony's password-protected account on MySpace. Mm -hmm. And she is doing some kind of research for shot girl costumes. Um, And this is believed to be for Tony Lazaro. Remember, that's her boyfriend at the the time. Yeah, he has, um, you know, these nightclub type events that that he goes to and she is going to be a part of that. Now, it's been reported that she might have been managing um, some of these shot girls or or assisting in some manner with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Or she could have just been looking for some kind of outfit to wear to to the nightclub Um, at 756 a.m. We see uh, more more computer uh, activity. Uh, this is being in some chat rooms at 1250 PM. Now this is according to George Anthony. Uh, he states that Kaylee departed with Casey in their vehicle in the Sunfire around 1250 PM. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes on to describe, uh, you know, he can even describe some of the outfit that, that both of them were wearing, right. uh, stating that there were backpacks on their shoulders. Um, and he is under the impression that that Casey is going to go off to work and Kaylee is going to go to the baby babysitter's house. Right. So she, yeah, she's going to go to Zanny na- the Zanny the nanny's house mm-hmm. and that that Casey's actually in work attire is what he claims. Now at 1:39 p.m. there's activity associated with Casey's uh, instant messenger and MySpace and Facebook accounts mm-hmm. uh, on the home computer. Uh, the last browser activity is, session is at 1.42 p.m. At 1.44, Casey calls her friend Amy. Uh, remember, now this is Amy that is uh, living with her ex-boyfriend that she supposedly lived with for, right. for some period of time. The one she stole some checks from. Yeah, yeah, that, that good friend. Mm-hmm. Um, at 2.21 p.m., the call with Amy ends. And at 2.30 p.m., George Anthony testified that he left the home at this time to go to work. Now at 2.49 p.m., Casey Anthony's cell phone connects with a tower nearest the home and the Anthony the Anthony family's desktop computer is activated by somebody using a password protected account mm-hmm. uh, for Casey Anthony. At 2.51 p.m. on the home computer, there is a Google search made for the term of foolproof suffocation Uh, The word suffocation was misspelled, Um, Mm -hmm. but whoever was searching this uh, clicks on some articles regarding foolproof suffocation or ways to die. Right. And then this article, they talk about black trash bags. They talk about duct tape, Mm -hmm. different things of that nature. Then shortly after that, we see more activity on MySpace Um, at two, just before three o'clock. Casey answers uh, a phone call from Jesse. Uh, this this guy says that he describes this conversation as abnormal. Uh, Casey stated to him that her parents were divorcing and that she would need to find a, a new place to live. Mm-hmm. Uh, at 3.04 p.m., Casey disconnected the phone call from, Je- from Jesse uh, to take an incoming call from her father, George. Now, according to according to the trial records, uh, this was a 20, 26 second call uh, from her father, mm-hmm. and he says that. Well, we got some conflicting stories on this. Of course, we do. Because what what the defense is going to try to tell us is that basically what happened is George called Casey as soon as he got to work, and the reason that it's such a short call is that he was basically saying, you know. I took care of everything. Hint, hint, you know, that kind of situation. Um, that's what the defense says. Yes. Basically telling Casey that he had disposed of the body, uh, warning her not to tell her mother about the child's death and that he had disposed of the body on his way into work that day. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your feelings about this phone call here, captain? Because it is very strange to me. First of all, 
we we have a situation where Casey supposedly left the house at 1250, but we see some activity on the computer that one might expect that to be more of Casey Anthony type activity. Right, right, right. Um, it was a shared computer. It was it was the family computer. Yeah, but if somebody doesn't log out of something, you mm-hmm. know, if I have my computer open and there's Facebook open and a bunch of other stuff open, um, and you're clicking around and maybe exiting it out of some programs, I, I don't know if that would count as the same activity because I'm not an IT expert. Mm-hmm. But so it could be somebody clicking around because George was there at the house, or it's possible that she left for a minute and came right back and George didn't notice. That is possible as well. Yeah, I I think my thoughts are one of two things. Either George is lying and that the two of them didn't leave or maybe Mm -hmm. mistaken. Maybe the two of them didn't leave at 1250 like he thought they Mm -hmm. did. Or two, that exactly as you said, it's it's a shared computer. Maybe he's just clicking and closing out of something so he can check his personal email. I, I, I really don't know how those things work. Right, but let's talk about what the major problem with this case is. Is it's very similar to like Adnan Syed's case. Mm-hmm. I hope I said that right, or I'm going to get a bunch. You, of you're very close. If not pretty, exactly yeah. right. right. You're exactly right. The, one of the issues is same with that case is because it's 31 days before you even report the child missing, mm-hmm. and now everybody's trying to figure out when is the last time we saw this individual. Yeah, and then. Once you kind of figure out that date, because here's a couple things. Casey Anthony claims the ninth. The parents then say, no, it's the 16th. And, and at some point the, the, uh, on one of the phone calls, um, the mother says "Eh, it was the seventh or something. Mm -hmm. Like she gives a whole different date. So the fact that they have to start looking back and yeah, we have these records, but as far as when George left, you know, look, I can't, I can't buy any of that stuff. And the fact of the matter is we got three, we got three liars, right? Yeah. And, and there's t- constantly times that they're lying about stuff. Now, a lot of people would say, well, don't throw George under the bus. What was he lying about? George and his wife, they separated for a while and one of the reasons why they separated was because he was lying to his wife and got into a bunch of financial trouble and he was being dishonest so there's evidence of him being a liar sydney is constantly lying about stuff constantly covering up her tracks constantly lying to help her her daughter and then and then obviously casey anthony we know she's lying because she lied for for 31 days to her parents yeah so I can't believe anything that they're saying. All I can go on is by work records. And so if if George clocked into a to his job, I believe that. Mm-hmm. Why did he call? I don't know. I'm not going to believe the defense over or over George. And and what we do know is George is at work at X time. The mother's at work early in the morning. The only person really home is Casey, right? And Kaylee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing here is we, you know, with the Adnan case, you know, the one thing they bring up when you're talking about trying to remember what happened a week ago or two weeks ago, or in this case, 31 days ago, uh, sometimes things are easier to remember when you have a special day. You know what I mean? When something, Mm -hmm. something exciting or something big happened for you that day, I think that they got the date right of the last time that they saw Kaylee because Cindy clearly remembers going to visit her father on Father's Day and, and swimming with Kaylee that night. Uh, so I, I believe that they had the date right, but I'm with you, Captain. I don't know if they would know exactly when uh, Casey left right, I'm just left saying for some work. of the, the, yeah, the date is correct, but what I'm saying is, is some of the details are blurry. George would say that before Casey and Kaylee left that day, um, that, she, that Casey had told him that she had a work function uh, that would require her to either be out of town or stay overnight somewhere. Of course. Um, right. And that Kaylee was going to be staying at the nanny's overnight and that she had already previously discussed this with her mother. Um, I don't have any information from Cindy backing that up. But again, like you said, sometimes it's hard to believe uh, some of these things that we're hearing mm-hmm. now regarding the phone call though. So he gets 26 seconds. I don't know what it is. He gets to, well, I don't know what it is either, but here, here's, here's the vibe I get. All right. 
I get the vibe that Cindy is is willing to turn a blind eye to certain things that Casey does, probably because she wants her granddaughter close to her. She wants the granddaughter to stay at home. The vibe I get from George is that he probably for a long time has had a lot of problems with the things that Casey does. Mm-hmm. He, he has stated several times before she was suspected of anything that she's a liar. Uh, he stated plenty of times that he doesn't appreciate her uh, being suspected of taking money from them, abusing privileges, look, taking not, the car. Right, no, right, no right. but I'm getting to what I think that the phone call was because this phone call is suspicious on George's part, in my opinion. It's strange to just show up at work and the first the first thing you do is call your daughter on the same day that we believe Kaylee Anthony di- disappeared mm-hmm. and have a 26-second phone call. It does look good for the defense and bad for George. What I'm saying here is the vibe that I get is that Casey probably did something small to piss him off. It could have been anything. I get the vibe that he had a problem with a lot of the things she was doing. And I, and I can say, we know this, we all have dads and some of the dads keep an eye on their turf, on their territory. They are the king of the castle. It might've just been a quick phone call that said, you know what? You left the garage door open again. I'm sick of this crap. Or, you know, I found this here, you know, Mm -hmm. these dirt, you left dirty clothes all over the floor or you left the computer on again. You know, any of these little things that tick you off as a parent, he's probably just calling her to, to state that. Yeah, possibly. Now, at this is after the phone call from George. At 3.34, Casey made a phone call to her then-boyfriend, Tony Lazaro, but the call goes unanswered. Um, between 4.10 and 4.14 p.m., Casey made six unanswered phone calls to her mother. Mm-hmm. Now, what we see with this cell phone activity, you know, we have the call from her dad, the unanswered calls to her mom and to the boyfriend, Uh, We see a situation where her cell phone is pinging uh, off of a tower that would indicate that she is near the house, near the Anthony home, Mm -hmm. up until about 4.11 p.m. Now, it's believed that at this time, she left the home and she was driving toward Tony Lazaro's apartment. Um, At 7.54 p.m. that night, we have video footage for this. Uh, Casey Anthony and Tony Lazaro are seen entering and walking around casually at a blockbuster video store. Remember those the blue buildings that had the videos that they would rent you? Mm-hmm. Um, so we have Tony and Casey there at the blockbuster that evening on videotape, um, and they, they're renting movies. They rent uh, the movie Jumper and Untraceable. Um, there is video footage of this, of the two of them walking up and down the aisle, looking for something interesting to watch. But the curious thing here is trolling around, just trolling around. The curious thing here is that Kaylee is not with them in any of this video footage on to the following day. We have June 17th, 2008, uh, George and Cindy Anthony would later report that on this date that they noticed that the gate to the swimming pool is open and that the ladder is next to the pool. They had one of those ladders that you had to kind of, you had to place it onto the above ground pool right. and you could take it down later for, for safety precautions. Um, the, the thing here is there are several people at Cindy's work that did state that, that on, they remember at least one occasion, Cindy explaining that the, the pool, the, the ladder to the pool was left up on many occasions, um, mm-hmm. stating that she actually thought that people, while she was at work, that neighborhood kids were climbing in the pool and swimming in the pool while nobody was at the house. That's possible. Um, now, a lot of these, well, I shouldn't say a lot, all of the people that reported remembering having heard her say this, they could not give a date. They could not place a date on this. Right. Um, so we don't know if this 17th is, is just good for Cindy's story or if it's factual. Um, but what also took place that day is that Casey Anthony posted a message on her uh, Facebook page. And again, I'll use air quotes when I describe this person her, to her friend. Well, it's on her friend's page, Amy, uh, mm-hmm. the girl that she stole the checks from. And on her Facebook page, she writes, cheer me up, lady. I love you. And I can't wait to get you finally moved in. Um, I'm guessing they might be talking about the ex-boyfriend's apartment or something. On the next day, on the 18th, uh, Casey is visiting with friends, again, without Kaylee. Uh, During this visit, Casey tells her friends that her parents are having a lot of problems. 
that uh, Casey's father, George, has been cheating on Cindy and that the two were going to get divorced. Uh, she told her friends that her mother had told her that George is going to be out of the picture and that it would just be the three of them girls. Um, but also that same night, she she tells her friends that she's planning to buy a home um, in a subdivision on Curry Road, stating that the home would be just for her and Kaylee and that she was planning on spending about $250,000 to buy a nice home for the two of them. Wait, this is what this is what Casey is saying. Yes. Case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you have this story at the beginning of the night about the parents are going to split up Two, $250,000 home mm-hmm. with that job. You've been working really hard. That fictitious job. You've been working really hard for two years and a fictitious job. And you're going to buy a house for $250,000 mm-hmm. still money from all your family members. Okay. On the 19th, Casey makes arrangements for her and Tony to go look at an apartment together. Uh, according to the guy that showed them the apartment, this is actually somebody that Casey had gone to high school with. Uh, he says that Casey was very upbeat during the visit. Uh, she was full of smiles. She was extremely happy. And that... He, YOLO, bro. Well, and he, he says that he was happy with the, the meeting as well because uh, it seemed to him that the decision whether or not they were going to get the apartment mm-hmm. mostly fell on Tony. Uh, whether he liked the apartment or not, because the situation was explained to him that Tony would have to break his current lease. Remember, he's at the condo right, right. Uh, to get a new place. I probably should check myself and calm down a little bit and get back into just the podcast. All right. All right. Well, try, try to remain calm because this might upset you. Um, now, later that day, and this is well into the evening, and maybe it's because they wanted to go out and celebrate. Well, the- let, let me just tell a little story about Tony's, uh, his roommates, yes. just so we have this kind of picture going. She starts saying this guy, Tony, which is, you know. He's uh, like college age. Yeah, he's a DJ, and his friends are kind of DJs and throw these parties. No big deal. W- what is interesting about this is when she first started visiting Tony, she brought her child around. Right. And so Kaylee was around and then, and it seemed like all the roommates were like, Oh, this is a cool little kid, mm-hmm. you know? And, and a lot of kids, even though they're in their early twenties, a lot of people have, you know, uh, younger siblings or whatever. So they all really liked Kaylee. And then it was like, I'm going to come over and bring my kid for a couple weeks. And then it became, I'm not taking my kid over anymore. Mm-hmm. So it was weeks and weeks of the roommates going, oh, hey, where, hey, where's your daughter? Oh, well, she's with the grandparents, or she's with the nanny. Well, I and, just want to kind of set that scene for you. Yeah, and 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 by this point, we're at the nineteenth. You know, mm-hmm. she stayed the night there a couple nights in a row without the daughter. Um, but you know, they've looked at the apartment, and now they're going to go out to the nightclub. And like I said, I don't know if it's they were celebrating because they were going to get an apartment together, or if they were just you know, out at one of Tony's functions or whatever or networking or what. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But this is somewhat, it could be somewhat related to Tony's work. Um, the, the thing here is this is the, this is the night that we all kind of know about because they go out on the 19th and they're partying until the early morning hours of the 20th. Well, that's where that famous picture is from where she's in the blue dress and she's, you know, dancing on another, on another woman, mm-hmm. um, trolling around. Yeah. So that's, that's the night that this picture is from. Mm. And this is the picture that they claim she was paid for as a promotional picture, but this is also the one that they claim that it was a hot body contest. Right? Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a photograph that was, that took place when she was participating mm. in the hot body contest at the fusion night. Club. Well, good thing. It wasn't like a hot face contest cause she went out one. A couple days later, on the 23rd of June, Anthony Lazaro would later testify that he helped Casey Anthony break into the shed at her parents' home to take gas cans for Casey's car. Mm -hmm. Uh, This car had run out of gas, obviously. Uh, Lazaro said that he watched Casey open the trunk of her car, and he did not see the inside of the trunk. Uh, But he did did state that he did not detect any odor or remembered odor. Uh, detecting any odor when that took place Mm -hmm. on the 24th the next day george anthony calls the police to report a break-in um to report the gas cans as missing 
Um, later this day, he sees Casey at the Anthony residence and he confronts her about taking the gas cans. Uh, George said that when he went to get the cans out of Casey's car, she like runs past him. She quickly opens up the truck. What actually happens is he was asking for a jack because he was, you know, where you jack the car up Mm -hmm. and he was going to jack his wife's car up so he could change the tires. And when he said, I want to go get that jack out of your car, she was like, no, 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 I got it. Mm -hmm. She runs past him, opens up the uh, the trunk, pulls out the jack and by the way, here's your gas cans. Mm-hmm. And that's where he gets upset because he's going, well, you make me look like a jackass because I called and reported these stolen. And I always found it weird that he called and reported the gas cans as stolen. But when I looked into it a little more, there, there's there's more to that story. It, you know, they actually physically broke into the shed. Right. You know, growing up, we had a shed in our backyard. We, 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 my house, we didn't keep it locked most of the time. Anybody mm-hmm. could have just walked in there. Um, but his situation, he had a padlock or some kind of lock on the shed that was actually broken so that the person could get in and, and steal the gas can. So that makes sense to me now, having the full report of it. Well, it's also 2008, so gas was a lot more expensive. You know, you're looking at 4 to $5 a gallon, maybe more in Florida. Well, and, and what else does this tell you? If somebody's willing to break into the shed, you know, this is something you want to report, regardless of how small the item is that they may have taken. On the uh, 30th of June, uh, this is when the vehicle is towed um, to the lot. Mm -hmm. Um, It had sat there for a few days, um, and her her purse and a child's car seat are found in the backseat of that Pontiac Sunfire. And on July 2nd, 2008, well, that's when Casey gets the very famous Bella Vita tattoo on her back. We've all seen pictures of that tattoo. Um, And then that takes us to roughly July 15th and 16th, uh, this being when George and Cindy pick up the vehicle, the Sunfire, from the impound lot, Mm -hmm. um, and they bring the vehicle home, and they finally get Casey home that evening on the 15th, and then they discover that the granddaughter is missing. Um, Some things that I do want to point out is regarding some statements that the... Uh, that Tony Lazaro and his roommates have said uh, mm-hmm. that took place during this time. You know, they had, you know, Casey would stay there. You know, this that wasn't super abnormal. Um, however, she would never stay for an extended period of time like this. And she was there basically, basically staying the entire time. Um, one thing, there was a few things that the guys found odd about her, her visit, let's say. First of all, they never saw Kaylee during any of that visit. Right, uh, during that 30-some days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which they found to be extremely strange. However, Casey had a story for that. And right. the story was that her parents were going to be separating and that there was a lot of arguing going on at the Anthony household and that she didn't want to be there and she didn't want her daughter to be there. Furthermore, because this condo was occupied by, by a bunch of college-age dudes, um, she didn't think that it was the place was fit for her daughter to be staying there for an extended period of time. And that Kaylee was simply off with the nanny, uh, that she was being watched uh, daily and nightly by the nanny. Um, the, the other thing that they found strange was unless they went to the club or unless one of them went somewhere with Casey, she never seemed to really leave, which they found strange because she supposedly had this job. Now, one thing they were mm-hmm. they kind of they kind of overlooked some of this stuff, I think, because they did say while she was there, you know, she was she was in a good mood all the time. She was mm-hmm. extremely friendly. She was cleaning up after them. She was cooking meals. Mm-hmm. Um, when they asked her about her job, you know, don't you have a job to go to? Uh, she basically told them that uh, her boss was really cool, and because they had a computer there, she was able to do a lot of the work. Uh, her event coordinator position uh, for Universal. She was able to do a lot of that work at the apartment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because when you have a fictitious job. She's got an can, answer for everything. You can do a fictitious work on any computer. You can even do fictitious work for your fictitious job at a fictitious computer. Well, and the other thing, too, is they notice that, that more often than not, I think even one of the guys reported that he believed that every time Mm -hmm. that Casey's cell phone would ring, that she would get up, leave the apartment and take the call outside. 
Uh, mm. And they would see her pacing back and forth outside on these phone calls. Some of them were long phone calls. Well, some people are pacers when they talk on the phone. I, I am one of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, But maybe at the time it probably didn't seem that suspicious. Oh, well, she's going to talk on the phone. Maybe she just wants some A private. quiet space, yes. Right, and who knows who she's talking to. I mean, it could be talking to, you would assume, probably the nanny or your parents or or somebody of that nature. Yeah, and it's assumed now by most um, that a lot of those calls were the calls that Cindy was making to Casey, trying mm-hmm. to find out where they are, do they need anything, uh, when is she going to see Kaylee, um, things like that. And, you know, Casey always seemed to have an answer for when Cindy would call. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Cindy was like, well, at least let me... Let me say hi to her. You know, let me talk to her real quick. Right. She's here or there. Yeah. She's, well, she's not with me. She's napping. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, she's with the nanny. Uh, So there was always an answer. Now. When you hear that in the 911 tape too, I think pretty well. mm -hmm. So when she says, uh, I I, I gave you, I gave you many of times, many of days, no more days. Yeah. You don't get any more days. Yeah. And actually, at one point, Cindy pushed her pretty bad. You know, like, well, you got you so, got to at right, least right. you got to at least come by the house, or you know, let's at least let me see Kaylee. And I don't know exactly the date, but there was supposed to be a there was a date that Casey agreed to go back to the Anthony home, mm-hmm. um, and I believe it was on a Monday, and she was to bring Kaylee over to see the grandparents. Well, that day came and went. Well, Cindy calling Casey repeatedly finally gets Casey on the phone right. to say, Hey, what happened? We were supposed to, we were supposed to hang out today. I was supposed to see Kaylee today. What happened? And Casey states that, um, Zanny was driving and she was in a, uh, in a accident. Oh, of course. Oh. And it was a pretty severe accident and that Zanny would be staying at the Tampa hospital mm. and Casey and a friend of hers, uh, who, who they were going to do the surgery for, well, her friend, supposedly her, her daughter was being watched by the nanny as well. Right. right. And so, uh, but you would, you'd feel so disrespected as, yeah, you're the grandparents, but like I said, you're doing all the actions of the actual parents, you know, especially George, mm-hmm. you know, this, is, you are the father figure in this baby's life. And so it doesn't matter if you move out, you know what I mean? If you have a grandkid, those grandparents wouldn't be involved. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's fine that you're you're out and you're doing your thing. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Just make some time. We want to see it. We've done all these things to help you and to help your daughter. Just you know, we just want to see the kid. Mm-hmm. Well, regarding that accident with Zanny, um, not only was she in the Tampa hospital, mm-hmm. um, but her and her friend, as well as the kids, were forced to stay in a hotel in the Tampa area. And they weren't going to leave until Zanny's um, family members came in from out of town to be with her. So it's it's a situation of we see her basically buying time, you know, buying buying a few hours mm-hmm. or buying an evening, and then with something like this Tampa situation, we see her buying multiple days. I can get I can get mom off my back for multiple days. Uh, interesting question. I don't know the answer, but I wonder if they actually did research on the on the the DJ and the room the boyfriend and the roommates of their computers hmm. what she was searching for you know why she was doing her fictitious work what Casey Anthony was searching for on those computers probably a lot of MySpace and Facebook activity would be my guess pretending pretending to work no uh, yeah i understand that but i i wonder if there'd be some incriminating stuff hmm. you know you know what happens you know, when you're charged with murder. Right. Right. All right. You want to give final thoughts on this? <laughs> we haven't even got to the trial yet. I mean, we, <laughs> there's so much more to cover. We get some people the, have to work the allegations by the defense team, what the prosecution allege happens. I mean, it's one of the, one of the most fascinating and more intriguing trials that I can recall. Definitely. And it has significance in, in uh, true crime history. So we got a lot more to get to. All right, and well, let's get to that next week. Yeah, because I got to get out of here. I entered myself in the hot body contest down at the <laughs> Jimmy's Chicken Shack. <laughs> you're, you're, you have no chance of winning. 
Oh, have you seen the men at the Jimmy's Chicken Shack? I don't. I don't even. No, I have. They're full of wings and beer. All right. This this episode was brought to us by. Guess who's back? Bosch is back. Just a reminder that Bosch is back for season three. You can stream that now on Amazon. It's Titus Welliver at his best, starring as Detective Harry Bosch, the honest cop with the dark past, obsessed with punishing criminals. I love it. Based off of the best-selling novels by Michael Connelly. Check out Bosch season three streaming now on Amazon Prime. And check out this week's recommended reading, Incendiary by Michael Connell. For 16 years, long before the specter of terrorism haunted the public's imagination, the mad bomber terrorized the citizens of New York City in the 1950s. Read this book because you can enter the mind of a madman in a real-life story of how three men came together to capture him and change the face of detective work. Incendiary, the psychiatrist, the mad bomber, and the invention of criminal profiling by Michael Connell. Check it out wherever books are available. All right. Cheers, mates. Thanks for the love. Thanks for Make sure you follow us on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I need to get my Instagram numbers up. I'm in a race with somebody. I can't tell you who it is, but let me just tell it's you. Oprah. It's Oprah. <laughs> this person's a real douche canoe, okay? And, and I want to beat this person. So I got my paddles out, right? And I want to catch up. So follow us on Instagram. Uh, and, and like always, hope we uh, kept you company at work or on your commute. Uh, you mean a lot to us. And for the record, we did not call Oprah a douche canoe. That just accidentally came out like that. <laughs>